Liturgy. Liturgy literally means the work of the people. It is something that has been practiced for thousands of years and will probably continue for many years after. We're about to embark this summer in looking at the work of the people, experiencing the practice of liturgy. And so I thought that today we'd have a conversation about it. I'm Pastor Steve, uh, one of the pastors here uh, at, at Pasadena Covenant Church for Wednesday Reflection, where we learn more about Jesus and how to follow him and in turn fall in love with him a little bit more. And with me is Pastor Anita, our pastor for spiritual formation. And, um, and she has, uh, and this is a woman that I've known um, for several years and have found that there is a deep current of formation in her life. And, uh, and if you have ever had a con one conversation with her, you would find the same as well. We get to drink deeply from her wisdom. Of course, Anita will always say this is a conversation, and it is, and I'm glad that we're going to have this together so we can, we can experience the presence of God in the midst of us. And I hope that as you're watching it, you get to join in with us and hear a little bit more. So Anita, thank you for joining us today. Glad to. Well, let's begin. Um, so I know that uh, you have grown up in a church that was a little bit more liturgical than my Southern Baptist church experience growing up. Um, and so I, I would love for you to share a little bit about your um, your experience with this tradition of uh, and how liturgy had first um, touched you, engaged with you, uh, what you um, what how you were formed by it maybe in good and maybe not so good ways i don't know and have you share a little bit more about your own faith tradition so why, why don't you share that with us sure um yeah i grew up in the missouri synod of the lutheran church and if you aren't familiar with uh, lutheran liturgy we have a very strong commitment to kind of a formal service uh, every chapter of what happens in the service has a name. It's written in the program. It's written in the liturgy. It's often um, spoken or sung scripture. Um, all the words are designed to um, like build and give glory to God in the service, to have a, a time of confession and forgiveness, to lead up to the centerpiece, which frankly, is not the sermon, it's the Eucharist. Um, many Lutheran churches practice communion every week so that you gather around the table ultimately to, to gather the nourishment that you need for your spiritual living during the week. Um, I, I think as a kid, it was a lot of standing and sitting and standing and kneeling. And it, it's very similar to experience if you've been in a Catholic worth mass worship service. If you're not used to it, you kind of have trouble following, figuring out which book they're in. But if you're in it, you're when you're feeling inspired, you you feel super shaped by it. I was very shaped by it. I I think as a kid, I didn't realize how much scripture I knew. I didn't know that it was Psalms that I was learning and singing week after week or um, texts from the Old Testament, texts from Isaiah, um, but it's in there. I think uh, most kids who grew up from a kind of a structured background like that shove off. I was one of the nerdy type who did not shove off uh, in high school. Our This will date me, so just kind of bear with me, but we had our first... Uh, what we called a contemporary service, which meant we were allowing guitars in the church and it was going to be an acoustic experience instead of a, Oh my, exactly. Instead of choral music <laughs> with the choir in their sweaty, hot robes. Um, but our youth uh, pastor at the time could tell how much I really enjoyed uh, leading and developing in worship. And so he let me write, let and helped me write liturgy for our services and I mean, that's a pretty strong deployment of a kid, right? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody who he knew liked to write, but I also enjoyed inviting teenagers who this service was mostly filled with 
to come to God and to recognize the service was not so much for our enjoyment, but for God's enjoyment. Yes. And to be able to shape my own words that others would speak was pretty cool. So it's still in me. I still have that tradition. Um, I still care about how a service is put together. I still care about language, not so much to be legalistic, yeah. but to recognize it's there for a reason. Mm. Now, I'm curious what, what you grew up with with Southern Baptist, because that is not quite right next to Missouri no. Center. No, no, everything we're on the other side of the, the tree. Of the ranch. Uh, right. <laughs> well, you have to understand, like, so in high school, that's when I really started going to church um, on a regular basis. And that was in a Southern Baptist church in Singapore. So you're, you're, it's a Chinese church that have taken the Southern Baptist. So you have this, you know, interesting way of, of shaping the service that was, um, that was a little bit more structured than you would think, a uh, quote unquote, regular evangelical non-denomination or Southern Baptist church would be. However, I think that almost all churches, uh, most churches really do have a form that they go by, that they're, they're a regular, you know, you, if you, if you have something that you begin with um, a prayer and then you have two songs and then you have some more prayer and then it's time to give an offering and then you have a sermon of which you have a, a chance to respond through music and then you end with a doxology perhaps there's a liturgy that you're formed by um, but i would remember for me um and, and you know i would not i did not know what a liturgy was even though i was in it i just knew that there was something coming up that i kind of anticipated it was a repeated pattern for me that I could be ready, that my heart would be ready to engage with. And um, I remember in high school uh, learning about how to pray. And the way that they taught me how to pray wasn't the Lord's Prayer, actually. Um, it was Acts Prayer, uh, A-C-T-S. It was adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That was the, the shape of our, there was my liturgy of, of my prayer, of, and that was the form. Um, I, I would say, too, uh, with the, the Lord's Prayer, we would pray that in church, and we knew that that was going to happen because the person that was praying would somehow meander his prayer, and usually it's a, it's a male, but meander his prayer to, and that is why we would pray the way that the Lord has taught us to pray, saying, and everybody just got into it, and they knew, and I see by your nodding that you had that experience as well. It was just, that was how we did it. Um, and and I that was the closest to liturgy that shaped me. It was just, I was anticipating the next thing. My heart was ready to engage and I didn't have to freeform it to the way that it's completely open and creative. I knew, and so I could rest on this form, even though- I, I like that word, freeform, and then there, there's a kind of architecture to- Yeah. Other people call it like fixed prayer or- Right. Yeah. Now that can sound kind of crummy, fixed prayer. <laughs> like it's a oxymoron, but, but it's also learned and practiced and repeated yes. ways to notice the sacred, yes. to, to have words and language point to the things that are above or beyond yeah. in just the ordinariness. And so for me, that's what liturgy, it came alive to me. It's not just repetitious droning. It's <sighs> living in a reality and helping to point others to it. Right. Well, I, and I think some people would say, well, why do we have to memorize all these prayers? Why can't we just speak it from the heart? And I would say, and my challenge is, we memorize and know a lot of pop songs. You know, I mean, my kids can rattle off almost all of the songs in Hamilton. I just have to start with one or two words or two two notes and they can just why wouldn't you rather have the words of god or desire of prayers locked into yourself that you can live into 
on a regular basis. I know that uh, you know Kathy Barsati was shared that she's cat. I know her from coming her from her Catholic upbringing. There were certain prayers that would be said when things would, around her would happen. So for instance, she said, when there's a first responder siren that would go off, there was automatically a prayer to pray to the Holy Family that fled from danger. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's this prayer that would that automatically lodged in just three three sentences, but that was enough. And, um, and uh, how about for you, what were some of the, I mean, prayers for you that kind of continue to live on the surface of your life? Well, I'm struck by when you were saying, um, you know, this automatic thing that Kathy has. I, I have some of that too. I have like brain memory or muscle memory for experiences that have just gotten rooted inside of me because I've been taught to say things that come to life in the moment. Mm -hmm. For me, that is the value of like four years. Um, I know Kathy has done this as well as have others in the church. I prayed the hours. I've when I awaken in the morning, when I notice it's nine o'clock, when I notice it's noon, when it's mid afternoon, when it's evening, and when it's time to rest, to try to turn my eyes to God and to use literally the moving of the clock to to draw myself to prayer. And it it's not um, it's not designed to be fruitful for me so much as to accustom me to being related to God in a regular way Wow! the ordinariness of my day. So um, you and I, when we were talking ahead of time said, when was the last time you actually memorized a prayer? Uh -huh. And it's probably a while ago, unless you've actively done this. Um, you know, when you're a kid, you learn yeah. your nighttime prayers, the dinner prayer, maybe a prayer when you're praying because someone is sick ways that your family habituates around certain words that they enjoy saying, but it kind of dies out unless you build a practice of learning new prayers to yeah. say. And, yes. you know, when we got inspired to think about this new sermon series about every moment, holy, it's an idea to enliven the congregation again, to get hold of some new prayers. Yes. Notice some new things about what God is doing and put words to it. Let our imaginations come alive again That's about right. God who is living among us in in the sacredness of, of every moment. I, I like what you said about how these prayers are not for your enrichment as much as it is to uh, make you accustomed to the presence of God. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this God has never been apart from us. It's just that our eyes are just looking at everything else because our world is so good at catching our attention. And um, and here, the hours, following the hours, uh, uh, praying the hours allows us to say, oh, yeah, I still belong to God. And, and just You're, look at your head is doing it right. There's a rhythm to that. Totally. That, absolutely. That it's to, you know, draw our attention again. Right. Just like in centering prayer to notice the stray thought and return again to the one who is loving us. Yes, yes. Well, Dan has preached about and talked about cultural liturgies, things that draw us away from, from the life we have with Jesus. And there are a jillions of them. That's right. And that what we're hoping, what we're praying is that as we're getting ready to launch this whole year of focus towards what's the next hundred years of this church going to be, just tiny little bite-sized ways of paying attention and noticing mm. the God who is gazing at us is something that we can begin to collectively do, communally do. Well, we, we, we are beginning to do that in our benediction, which we're praying out of numbers, mm -hmm. where it says, may the Lord turn his face upon you. Mm -hmm. The sense that we're even recognizing that there is this calling for one another to take, pay attention to the face of God that that shines his delight upon us and his countenance upon us, which is wonderful. I, I, I know you've said, like you, you, you pray blessings on your kids. So there, there are ways that these become taken into our everyday living. Yeah. So, you know, I think even as you seek people to come and give Wednesday reflections or conversations about what difference has it made to try to practice 
some of these prayers or finding a liturgy for something that's meaningful in your family, there's an example. And I hope others will say, you know what, I'm excited about, you know, something that got prayed two weeks ago, and here's how it showed up in my own life. That's right. We're all going to train our hearts here to be mindful of God in all moments. Yes. We're going to talk about this in a, in a few weeks, um, but one of the prayers that I'm, we're, I'm inviting us into is the liturgy of the morning coffee. And um, so you don't have to be a coffee drinker. You can do it for other things, but it was just kind of the way the, at your first beverage. And um, I have, I actually had this, that prayer printed out from this book, Every Moment Holy. There you I go. There's the book. Day, every Moment Holy. Every Moment. This is our creation. This is our inspiration. That's right. That's, it's a great book for those of you that um, do not have it. Uh, I highly recommend it. We'll put a link to the, um, to the, um, to the website where you can find it. And I, I highly recommend it. There's many prayers, but the one that I have is, is about beginning your morning with a cup of coffee and you, and, and as I sip it, I pray. So my, at my first sip, I just begin with it and say, meet me. Oh, Jesus in the quiet of this morning, move me. Oh spirit to quiet my heart. Mend me, O oh Father, from yesterday's harms. And then I begin to pray. And it's just a, a way for me to not have to think my way in creating a new prayer, but to follow the path. And mm -hmm. it becomes this way I can just re relax into that, into that prayer, knowing that it is true of, of what I need. And I love that one too. <laughs> That's an easy, accessible one. It sure is. It, it talks about resurrection. Just resurrect, you know, from the discords of yesterday, resurrect my, uh, was it? No, from the disappointments of yesterday, resurrect my um, my hope. And it goes on and so on and so forth. I, I, I just, I love it. I really do. So how does this... Um, how does liturgy and we talk we're talking about it with coffee and, and things like that but how does liturgy fit into our everyday lives because i think a lot of us when we think about liturgy it's locked in on a sunday morning right anita i mean i think that we we often think liturgy and not even our liturgy like we don't even think passing covenants for some of us we might think we do but for others we just say oh no we just go to church we don't we don't do that stuff of standing up, sitting down, doing the mm -hmm. sign of the cross, kneeling. Um, so we're moving, we're even talking about saying it doesn't even actually have to be belong and be locked in to, on a Sunday worship service. It actually spills out into our everyday lives, every moment holy. How for somebody that's a that, different mindset right there. That's yeah. the answer. It's a different you know, even the it doesn't stay fixed in Sunday morning tells us how much we think that liturgy is just churches. But instead, this is really reminding us that if every moment is holy, then there is never a time when we do not have access That's to right. engage with God. That's and right. that what I what I love about um it's actually Douglas McKelvey that wrote these particular things, is he'll have like a liturgy for those who sleep in tents. A liturgy for people who've not done great things for God. Yes. Uh, well, you know, there's, all, there's actually a second. Homesickness. Yes. You know, that are like, they're really the human experience brought before God in prayer. And there, there's nothing that falls outside of being able to be brought with the spirit to prayer to see that all of life is live before with and under god and, and and there's a liturgy for when you have to change a diaper mm -hmm. i just think that's a lot of prayer going on there there was a woman um that i love her reading who who wrote a book about you know laundry and liturgy and women's work and how it's it's sanctified it's lifted up from ordinariness to sacredness by bathing it in language that really recognizes that all things that we do can be done for God. Amen. It, you know, we've got lots of books from the past and the present on practicing the presence of Jesus. So 
Right. That's that's why liturgy is not what happens Sunday morning in the bulletin. That's right. It's, it's all practicing the presence of Jesus in most often ordinary times and only occasionally at a Sunday worship service. Which is why the gospel of Jesus as written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John aren't about Jesus preaching on Sunday or, su or the Sabbath. It is Jesus was walking by the lake. Uh, Jesus talking about kneading dough. Jesus talking about uh, uh, you know, the birds of the field, Jesus talking about farming. It's everything, this, this, this God that we have, as we talked about even, you know, on Sunday morning, that Jesus incarnate is in the flesh, not locked on believing that his, his practice and experience of God is locked in on a particular time, but it's, it's all time because our God is eternal and he's present everywhere. Yeah. I think, yeah, actually during the service when you were ready to speak and the um, siren went off at the fire station there, I think that was sneaky God getting his, you know, getting his first glimpse in there for us to notice and you noticed. And then for Terry to say, yes. the ambulance came to my neighborhood. Yes. It, it, to me, I would see that as an opportunity again to notice something holy happening. Yes. God showing us, I am inserted in your city while you're here praying. Yes. There is work being done of healing, of ministry to those in need. Yes. Yes. And it got your attention. Amen. Couldn't have planned it more perfectly. No, no. There, there was a time where um, I was leading a, a, a group of staff workers with inner varsity in a time of worship and right and we were meeting at a church that had um, a preschool um, that they're going at the same time and right as I was about to begin the song um, there's these kids that started just crying like sad crying and um, and immediately I um, and and it was pretty disruptive you know because we were trying to get into this you know we're getting into the music and the the, the, the chords are going the, the sounds are going and then i i recognized right at that very moment that god was inviting the children to lead us in worship to make us recognize that his presence is everywhere there was this breaking out of of like we said this is the way that it's supposed to be so um and, and that was, again, capturing a very holy moment for us. One of the thoughts we talked about, and we've talked about it in staff, too, is coming out of the isolation and this repetitive separateness that we've had has been exhausting for everyone. And we don't, we don't expect that people are coming back raring to go. Yeah. We expect that people are coming back where we are, which yeah. is depleted, uh, disoriented, still trying to figure out what we think and feel and what we're going through and how to emerge in some way that feels enlivening. And so this feels, again, like a, a church-wide communal practice of turning our attention to God before anything else happens for us. It's many weeks from, you know, the beginning of June until we launch whatever we launch in fall, trying to keep our hearts and our minds together fixed on noticing Jesus. And that feels to me like a, a balm for our tiredness and our, our worn outness. Yes. Yes. I love that. I don't want it to be heavy. No. You don't want it to be heavy. You don't want it to be new assignments for people to, you know, feel burdened by having to do this new spiritual thing. It's just turn your eyes on Jesus. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's, it's the Psalm 139 prayer. Wherever I go, there you are, rise up on the, uh, the uh, you know, the wings of dawn and sail out to the farthest ends of the sea. And 
there you're with me, your right hand holds on to me. I've prayed that enough. I've memorized it enough. It's formed myself that even this morning as I felt my weariness, I could say, and yet you hold me. And I think that that's what we need this, this summer is uh, in every practice, we become more and more accustomed to the, the hand of God that grips us in that ever tenderness and presence and strength and kindness that, um, that prepares us. Mm. Yeah. Spirit, make it be so. Amen. I look forward to that. Well, Pastor Anita, it is just as usual, been a joy. And, um, and I am so grateful for all of you that were, were watching this, uh, that even this conversation is holy. And uh, we hope that, I know, I, I, I definitely feel enlivened and excited about what's happening in our church, even on Sunday morning when we were there together and and as we do it here um, on, on Zoom or on our on Wednesday Reflection, and, and as we learn how to do these prayers, may it be so. So, Pastor Nita, thank you so much for sharing this time with me. Peace. Peace.